Well, good morning, church. Welcome to the month of June. It's here. It's good news. It's officially summertime, I guess. Uh, Today, we are concluding our series in the Lord's Prayer. Let's do a little review of where we've been thus far. Um, What what we did when we started this series is we acknowledged that Jesus' disciples came to him, the, the gospel writer Luke tells us, and they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And um, in response to that request, uh, Jesus gave us what we know as the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that we just recited together. And, and what we've observed in this series is that the Lord's Prayer is a model, not a mantra. All right? So it's not something we're supposed to just sort of repeat mindlessly, but rather what Jesus is doing is he's giving us a structure and a pattern and an outline for what it means to pray. You know, we, we notice that it begins with an address, our Father who art in heaven. And then like the Ten Commandments, we noted that there are sort of two tables or two sections to the Lord's Prayer. Uh, The first section uh, focuses on God. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So we're asking for God to be lifted up and exalted and honored. The second table focuses on our real needs. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation. And so we're asking God to intervene in the very everyday, ordinary places in our lives. So that's where we've been over the last eight or nine weeks. And and you'll notice that when we recite the Lord's Prayer, we conclude it with this nice little doxology. Uh, Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. However, if you open your ESV Bible and you look down at Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, you will notice that that phrase is not in there. So what's up with that? Well, answering that question gets us into a little bit of textual history, and so I need to take you deep down the rabbit hole this morning for a few minutes, all right? Hang with me. I promise I won't lose you. This is actually pretty fascinating stuff, but it's important that you understand and know the background here. The New Testament documents were originally handwritten in Greek and then hand-copied by scribes. So during the first three or so centuries after the life of Jesus, thousands of copies of the New Testament documents, the Gospels and the Epistles and the Book of Revelation, uh, were copied and dispersed throughout the empire. So there's these handwritten manuscripts. That's what a manuscript literally is, right? Manuscript, handwritten. Then, as you probably know if you took a little bit of world history, in 410 A.D., Rome falls to the barbarians, which ushers in this period of history known to us as the Dark Ages. Why do we call it the Dark Ages? Why are they known as that? Well, primarily because the Greek and Roman cultures prided themselves on philosophy and art and literature and learning, and the cultures they gave way to were more barbarian cultures that had less value for that sort of thing or or less of a monolithic cultural structure for producing that sort of thing. And so for about a thousand years, life became primarily about survival. Then in the mid-1400s, we begin this period of history that, that is known to us as the Renaissance, a word which literally means rebirth. It's a rebirth of learning and scholarship. And so if you're a student of history, you have to ask, well, what happened in the Renaissance that all of a sudden made this uh, avalanche of learning possible? Uh, The answer is really two things. Number one, the invention of the printing press in the 1450s. And number two, the fall of the city of Constantinople to the Muslim Turks in the year 1453. Uh, Think about just very recent history with me for a minute. Think about, in the last five years, the flood of refugees that we've seen emigrating from war-torn places like Syria and Iraq into Europe. We've all seen this on the news. We've been all been overwhelmed by sort of the human story of what's going on here. The fall of the city of Constantinople was a moment quite like that. Remember, the city of Constantinople, which is now Istanbul in modern Turkey, was built by the Roman emperor Constantine in the 4th century. So for a thousand years, the city of Constantinople had been a repository of the old treasures and artifacts of the ancient Roman Empire. And when that city fell, refugees poured into Europe and they brought with them many of the cultural treasures of the old Roman Empire. Books and works of art and ancient manuscripts, including... Ancient manuscripts of the Bible that were written in Syriac and Greek and Coptic and other ancient languages. 
And so in the year 1516, a Dutch scholar named Erasmus gathered up a bunch of those newly available ancient manuscripts, compared them and studied them, and released the first printed copy of the Greek New Testament. Erasmus's Greek New Testament became a sensation, and here's why. Because for a thousand years, scholars had primarily studied the Bible in Latin. Because that was the language that the church father Jerome had translated the Bible into. It was the language of the Western Roman Empire, and it was the language of scholarship and study. Now, however, these scholars could study the New Testament in the original Greek language, which was the language that all the documents were originally written in. Erasmus' Greek New Testament became the foundation for all of the early English translations of the Bible, most notably the King James Version. Now, since the Renaissance, thousands of additional ancient manuscripts have been made available to us through archaeology and through upheaval of culture. In fact, we currently have over 5,800 ancient manuscripts, handwritten manuscripts, of New Testament documents. And so there's a discipline within biblical studies called textual criticism, which seeks to compare all of those ancient manuscripts and arrive at the most accurate text of the New Testament. In other words, we we don't have the original Gospel of Matthew, which Matthew wrote with his own hand, or his scribe wrote with his own hand. But by comparing the 5,800 ancient manuscripts we do have, we're able to arrive at an accurate reconstruction of that document. What does all that have to do with what we're talking about this morning? Well, there are two schools of thought in textual criticism. One school of thought says that we should give priority and weight to the oldest manuscripts that we can find because they're the most likely to be accurate because they're closest to the originals. There's a second school of thought that says we should give the most weight to agreement among the manuscripts, because the more of those 5,800 manuscripts that agree with each other, the more likely they are to be correct. So, the ESV translation, which is what we tend to use most often at Coram Deo, follows a manuscript tradition that gives weight to the oldest manuscripts. And in those manuscripts, the phrase, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, is not there. And so notice what the translators of your ESV Bible have done. They have put a footnote in Matthew 6.13, and if you follow that footnote, you will find some manuscripts add, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Okay? So this is why, as a knowledgeable student of the Bible, you always pay attention to the footnotes, because translators, whenever there's um, difference among texts, they're going to say, hey, in a footnote, hey, here's another uh, way that some ancient manuscripts have this text. On the other hand, if you're reading from the King James Bible or the New King James Bible, The the text of Matthew 6.13 itself includes the phrase, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Because the King James translation follows that second school of thought, which gives weight to agreement among a broad number of manuscripts. Now, here's how the British scholar N.T. Wright brings all of this to bear on this doxology in the Lord's Prayer. He says, this concluding doxology was already well established within a century or so of Jesus' day, and it is actually inconceivable within the Jewish praying styles of his day that Jesus would have intended the prayer to stop simply with, deliver us from evil. Something like this doxology must have been intended from the beginning. So all that to say, this morning I am preaching on a phrase that does not appear in your ESV translation of Matthew 6.13, but that we do recite every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. And whether or not this phrase appears in every single ancient manuscript of Matthew 6, it obviously does reflect the clear teaching of Scripture as we see from places like 1 Chronicles 29, which you heard read this morning, and Romans 11. And so it is a right and fitting way for us to conclude our prayers Uh, which is why it's been enshrined in the spoken and catechized version of the Lord's Prayer since the time of the Apostles. Now, before we look at the particulars of this phrase, I want to zoom out for a minute and think together about why it matters, okay? Ponder this question in your own soul. What's the greatest 
struggle or temptation that you face in living as a Christian? What's the greatest struggle or temptation that you face in living as a Christian? Your immediate answer to that is probably very tangible. You probably struggle or wrestle with discouragement or doubt or anger or lust or selfishness or comfort. There are a number of things that perhaps come to mind. I want to suggest to you that those are all secondary. And that in fact, the greatest struggle, the greatest temptation that most of us face is simply the temptation to live entirely for the present moment. Why does anger tend to consume you? Why do you give in to lust? Why are you prone to discouragement? The answer is because you're tempted to live entirely in the present moment. You feel anger or lust or discouragement right now, and right now is the only thing that seems to matter, right? As Van Halen said a couple decades ago, Right now, come on, it's everything. That was, my, that was my best Sammy Hagar, you guys. It's the best I can do. Right, most of us are living a right now kind of existence. We're just responding and reacting to whatever is right in front of us, and we lack a long-term vision for life. Well, the Lord's Prayer exists in part to help us solve that problem. When Jesus gave his disciples the Lord's Prayer, he was aware that because of the nature of human existence, one of our greatest temptations is to get stuck in the present moment. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, our eyes are raised beyond the right now. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are confronted with three questions. What kingdom will you live for? What power will you live by? Whose glory will you seek? What kingdom will you live for? What power will you live by? Whose glory will you seek? This morning, these are the three questions we must face. These are the three questions the Holy Spirit wants to ask you. This is what God wants to put directly in your lap this morning. What kingdom will you live for? What power will you live by? Whose glory will you seek? Let's allow ourselves to be challenged by each of these questions. First of all, what kingdom will you live for? We conclude the Lord's Prayer by saying, thine, yours, is the kingdom. And so here's the question we have to ask. When you pray that, do you mean it? This phrase isn't some meaningless doxology that we just vainly repeat at the end of the Lord's Prayer. This is a vow of relinquishment. Right? We're saying, Lord Jesus Christ, it's your kingdom that I'm living for. It's your purposes that really matter in this world. It's you, not me, who gets to call the shots. What kingdom will you live for? If we just step back and ask, what's the opposite of thine is the kingdom? Right? The opposite is easy. Mine is the kingdom. Right? And that's the core temptation for every single one of us. Every single one of us is tempted to build our own little mini kingdom. Wherever you have power and agency, wherever your dominion has sway, there you will be tempted to build your own kingdom. And so the Lord's Prayer forces you to ask, is this about me 
or is this about Jesus? Am I going to live for my purposes or for his? As you perhaps know, perhaps not, but those of you who are sports fans know that the NBA Finals are taking place right now. It's basically the same story as the last four years, right? It's Golden State and Cleveland. It's kind of getting old, but that's what it is. And, and listen, I've been watching some of the games, and it's impossible to escape the fact that the NBA is in every way the kingdom of LeBron James, right? Like, love him or hate him. You either love him or you hate him. I know that you're on all sides of that equation. I don't know if he's better than Michael Jordan or not. Let's not have that argument right now. But here's what we can say, right? First of all, just respect the man's skill, right? Like, he, he's amazing to watch. He's clearly one of the best basketball players ever to play the game. So that's undisputed. But, but the other thing about it is just the, the entire NBA really sort of revolves around what's going on with LeBron. Now, he's not the only interesting or important player. He's not the only person who has influence and weight. But it's amazing to me. I was uh, taking a road trip last weekend and listening to sports radio. Literally the only thing anyone was talking about on sports radio is LeBron this and LeBron that and what about free agency and is he the best player ever and is he better than Jordan or is he not better than Jordan and how is Cleveland going to fare in the finals and you know like every conversation is about LeBron James. Why? Well one because he's great but two because the realm of professional basketball is a realm where he has fantastic authority and power, both by virtue of his skill, by virtue of his fame, and by virtue of how important a player he is. Here's the thing, though. At some point, who knows when, LeBron is going to get old. His influence is going to wane. At some point, the NBA will no longer be the kingdom of LeBron James. There'll be some other figure, some other star who we'll be talking about, who will step in and take that spotlight. And so no matter how great LeBron James' authority and power and influence is right now, it's not a power and influence that's going to last forever. And listen, that's the problem with your kingdom and mine, too. They can't last. Wherever we're tempted to build our own kingdom and, and extend our own power and authority and make things work for us, here's the problem. It can't last. Your kingdom is inevitably going to topple. And so the Lord's Prayer is an invitation to live for the only kingdom that's eternal. The only king who's worthy of adulation and glory and fame. The only king whose glory never fades. That's what the Lord's Prayer is an invitation to. What kingdom will you live for? That's the first question the doxology of the Lord's Prayer puts before us. Here's the second question. What power will you live by? Right? Thine is the kingdom and the power. What power will you live by? The greatest problem in many of our lives is that we are trying to walk with Jesus Christ by our own power. Listen to what Jesus tells his disciples in Luke chapter 24. He says this, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He's speaking here of the coming of the Holy Spirit. All right, so catch what Jesus is saying. By, by the way, do you ever catch yourself thinking this way? Like, man, I live in the 21st century. Um, it's a disenchanted world. Sometimes I feel like I'm nuts for believing in God. 
Nobody around me really believes there's any transcendent or ultimate reality. I believe this book that was written thousands of years ago and this Messiah who walked the earth thousands of years ago. Man, if I, if I had been there when Jesus was there, if I had seen him do miracles, if I had seen the resurrection with my own eyes, if I, like Thomas, had touched his side, man, it would be so much more easier to believe. Man, then, then I would be filled with power to witness. I wouldn't be scared of what people think. If I had seen that and been there, man, then I would be full of energy and passion and power for the kingdom of God. You ever find yourself thinking that way? <laughs> Catch what Jesus is saying to these people who were there, who did see him perform miracles, who watched him rise from the dead. He says, hey, I'm risen from the dead. The kingdom of God is here. There's a huge mission for you to be caught up in that involves proclaiming this gospel to the end of the earth. So here's what I want you to do. Nothing. Just wait. Don't, you guys don't try to go out and do anything. Just wait. Right? Listen to how 2 Peter 1.21 describes the writing of the scriptures. The apostle Peter tells us, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I love that phrase, carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, the particular aspect of the Spirit's work that that is talking about is complete, right? That's talking about the prophecy, the writing of Scripture. And that is done. But this reality of what it means to be carried along by the Holy Spirit that's a beautiful description of the kind of life Jesus means for us to live. Why did he tell people, hey, wait until you're clothed with power from on high? Because he wanted his followers, his disciples, to be carried along in life and in mission by the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's the question. When's the last time you can remember in your own life being carried along by the Holy Spirit? being sustained, being empowered, being invigorated by the Spirit of God. Can you remember that happening this past week? Or has it maybe been months, even years, since you experienced this sense that, man, the Holy Spirit is just sustaining me and carrying me along. Listen, here, here's the trade secret, okay? The Christian life is impossible to live in your own power. It's impossible. So if you're discouraged, if you're disheartened, if you feel like you're grinding it out and gutting it out as a Christian, here's what I can tell you. That's not where God intends you to stay. And perhaps the reason that you feel like it takes so much work and energy and effort is because you're trying to live a supernatural life in your own power. Thine is the kingdom and the power is an invitation for us to live in vital communion with the Holy Spirit. It's an invitation for us to say to God, fill me with your power. It's your power that I need to walk in faithfulness and obedience to you, to, to love my neighbor as myself, to live for your mission and glory. I can't do that in my own strength. What power will you live by? Here's the final question this text puts before us. Whose glory will you seek? Whose glory will you seek? Right? Thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory. Uh, whose glory will you seek? Whose praise, whose fame, whose honor will you seek? Again, the opposite of thine is the glory sounds like this. Mine is the glory. And again, that's how we often live, isn't it? I want to be seen. I want to be known. I want to be recognized. I want to feel like I matter. This intrinsic thirst that we have for glory, listen to me, has two faces. Don't miss this. 
Some of you are more obvious glory seekers, okay? You want the fame, you want the praise, you want to be recognized, and deep down you know it. Others of you don't want the spotlight. You don't want to be famous. You don't need everybody to know what you've done. You enjoy being behind the scenes. And yet, pay attention to what happens in your soul when your service is not noticed and appreciated. Notice what you begin to feel. Resentment. You know what that is? That's your soul saying, I'm not getting any glory. No one's noticing. I deserve credibility, respect, honor. So whether your glory seeking looks more obvious or a little more hidden, here's the question. Here's the question. If the only person who ever saw and noticed your service was the Lord Jesus Christ, would that be enough? Would you be satisfied with his approval and with his applause and with his affirmation and with his well done, good and faithful servant? I'm not saying that human affirmation doesn't matter. It does, right? We all want that. And that's part of the way that God makes his goodness and grace known to us is when other people say, hey, I appreciate you. But it's different to be blessed by that and to appreciate that, and to be encouraged by that, than it is to want that, and need that, and resent when you don't have that. Whose glory will you seek? Thine is the glory, is an invitation every day to lay aside my own reputation, and my renown, and my need for approval, and to reorient myself around the glory of God. Say his fame, and his honor, and his praise is what matters. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. What kingdom will you live for? What power will you live by? Whose glory will you seek? The Lord's Prayer, every time we pray, it brings us back to these three questions. And do you know why? Like you ever thought about, one really good way to read the Bible is just whatever you read to ask, why is this here? Why? Why? Does Jesus teach us to pray this way? Why, when we conclude the Lord's Prayer, do we need to be confronted with these three questions all the time? Here's why. Because these three questions are never settled once and for all. Wouldn't it be great if you could just say, okay, hey, today, I'm deciding. I'm going to live for God's kingdom. I'm going to live by God's power. I'm going to seek his glory. And then it would just be done, and the struggle would be over. Wouldn't that be great? There are versions of Christianity, by the way, that imply that it's just that easy. What's wrong with you? Just surrender to the Lord Jesus. But surrender, you see, is both decisive and daily. Yes, absolutely. You need to come to the place in your life where you decisively surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Where you bow the knee and say, Jesus, you're in charge. I'm coming under your authority. I'm submitting to you. My life belongs to you. Yes, you need to come to that place decisively. And also, you need to surrender every single day. Because that struggle to build your own little mini kingdom, that struggle of living by your own power, that struggle of seeking your own glory, those don't go away. Which is why Jesus teaches us to pray. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. When you pray, pray in this way. All right, in closing, notice that the Lord's Prayer functions in three ways, three distinct ways. First of all, the Lord's Prayer functions as an invitation. Specifically, an invitation to those who are not yet decisively surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The Lord's Prayer is an invitation to you. It's a beckoning. It's a throwing open of the, the, the hospitality of the gospel and, and saying, would you come in? Right, like in asking, in putting these questions before you, whose kingdom are you living for? What power are you living by? Whose glory are you seeking? Those questions are themselves an invitation, right? As we ask those questions, they make us wrestle with deep things in our souls. And so for those of you who are here this morning and you haven't yet decisively surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I would just say, well, listen, whose kingdom are you living for? What power are you living by? Whose glory are you seeking? Ask yourself those questions honestly. Jesus is a gentle Savior. He puts those questions before you, and he's, he, here's what he wants you to ask. How's that working for you? Like whatever kingdom you're serving, and whatever power you're trying to get through life with, and whatever glory you're seeking, how's that working out? Have you come to the place yet where it's empty and frustrating? If not, you're going to get there. Just give it time. And the Lord Jesus is inviting you to enter into his kingdom, to be filled with the power of his spirit, to be captivated by his glory. So there's an invitation to you, even this morning, to respond in faith and surrender, to bow the knee to King Jesus. Say, all right, Jesus, you are Lord. You are God. I'm bowing the knee to you. So the Lord's Prayer functions, first of all, as an invitation. It's a beckoning. The Lord Jesus Christ is saying to those of you who are not yet his disciples, hey, come. Come to my kingdom. Come, let me fill you with my power. Let me give you a better glory to live for, a glory that never fades. Second, the Lord's Prayer functions as a challenge as a challenge, a challenge to those of you who belong to Jesus, who have bowed the knee to him and received his grace. Here's the challenge. Where are you not right now living for his kingdom? Where are you not right now walking by his power? Where are you not seeking his glory? Will you acknowledge those places? Will you respond to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit? Will you repent and return again to the mercy and grace of your Savior? Will you come back to him in repentance? The Lord's Prayer functions as a challenge to all of us who would say we belong to Jesus Christ, to wrestle with those questions. So the Lord's Prayer functions as an invitation, as a challenge, and finally, the Lord's Prayer functions as an encouragement. As an encouragement. Right, so think with me about stress and emphasis, right? The first thing we need to acknowledge about the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer would be to pray it this, pray it this way. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory, right? Not mine. So it's an invitation to die to self and, and to submit and surrender to the Lord Jesus. But the second way to hear this conclusion is this way. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. These are statements of fact. They are simply True, and that should be a great encouragement to you. This is already true in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has come. He has taken on human flesh and blood. He has lived the obedient life that you and I have not lived. He has died in our place. He has risen from the dead. He has been victorious over Satan, sin, death, hell, and all of our enemies. And now he's been exalted to the right hand of the Father in glory. That's just all true. So there's nothing you and I have to do but to return in repentance and faith to what's already true. 
This is the great work of the gospel, right? Coming back again and again to what is, to what ultimate reality actually is by virtue of the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So when you pray the Lord's Prayer, let it be both. Let it be for you a statement of relinquishment. God, I'm taking my hands off the wheel. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Wherever in my life I'm building my own kingdom, wherever I'm trying to survive by my own power, wherever I'm seeking my own glory, let that fade away. Bring me back to you as the center and source of everything. And let it also be for you not just a prayer of relinquishment, but a prayer of worship. Jesus Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. These things are true. And so we can, we can go forward. We can walk ahead in life. We can have great confidence in who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing in the world. Why? Because this is just reality, friends. This just is. Be encouraged. Let's pray. Jesus, it's our desire to pray this in both these ways this morning. First of all, to relinquish our grip on our little kingdoms, to relinquish our white-knuckled attempts to live the Christian life in our own power, to relinquish our thirst for our own glory. So we give all that up to you. We pray that you would bring us again to repentance, to humility before you. Put your finger on the places in each of our souls where we're resisting your grace and your mercy and your power. We open our hands this morning before you. And, and we also want to pray this as a prayer of worship this morning. Jesus, the fact is yours is the kingdom. Your, your kingdom will never end. It can't be defeated. It will never uh, fade away. Yours is the power the Holy Spirit really has been poured out on the church and is available to us. Yours is the glory. There is no other God, King, person who is worthy of the fame and honor and prestige that you are worthy of. This just is. And so even as we bow our hearts in surrender this morning, we also lift our hands and our hearts in worship this morning. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power, yours is the glory, and in this is good news. So let us rejoice in it this morning. Let us embrace it this morning. Let us live in the beauty of it this morning for our good and your glory.